to illustrate uh, the difference, so this is what we all recognize as the Nymegan Bethesda assay. Of course, you have the patient sample. For dilutions of the patient sample, there's the factor eight deficient plasma. Of course, the aminazole buffered pool normal plasma as your source factor eight. And then your control mix in this assay is a one-to-one -one IB, PMP, and factor eight deficient plasma. So with our kit, the factor eight deficient plasma is replaced with an aminazole buffered BSA. We maintain the aminazole buffered pool normal plasma as is present in the Nymegan Bethesda assay. Control mix becomes a one-to-one -one of IB, PMP, and IB BSA. And of course, we have the negative and the positive controls with the kit. So this configuration is what makes up the cryocheck factor eight inhibitor kit. Now I'd like to take uh, just a couple minutes to walk through this assay. It's, um, you know, as we all know, it's it's a long and complex assay, and I, I, I think it's helpful to see how these different components are addressed at the various stages of the assay. So what I will start with is the pre-analytical heat treatment step. And I'll just pause to mention that um, we've taken some liberties with the scale here. These aren't giant vials, they are regular sized vials. Um, for the heat inactivation step, and this is to remove any factor eight present in any of these samples, which we know is an interfering substance in a Bethesda assay. So the positive control, negative control, and patient sample are all put into a 56 degree water bath for 30 minutes. Following that 30 minute heat inactivation, they're moved to a centrifuge and spun down for five minutes. Following this, when they're removed from the centrifuge, you will see that a pellet has formed at the bottom of the vials. This is the deactivated or denatured factor eight at the, at the bottom of these vials. So now we need to transfer the supernatant off of these vials into appropriately labeled vials for carrying out the remainder of the Bethesda assay. So we'll do that with the patient sample. We'll pipe at that supernatant off into, into a new vial. Um, we'll do the same with the negative control, being uh, sure not to disturb that pellet at the bottom of the vial. And then we'll also do that to the positive control. Now we've established our heat inactivated um, test samples for carrying out the serial dilutions of the test, sorry, the patient mix and the positive and negative controls. Now I'll, I, will, I will walk through the, um, the dilution scheme for the Bethesda assay. So what I've shown here is a neat to one in 32 dilution of the patient test mixes. I think people recognize this as a fairly common dilution scheme for quantifying low to mid tighter uh, samples. Now there's no reason you can't go out further than one in 32 to quantify higher titers. Um, I, I've just kept it to this level for demonstration purposes. So the first step of the assay is to add an equal amounts imidazole buffered BSA to your dilutions. Now we don't add any imidazole buffer to the neat sample, but we do add it to the one in two to one in 32 dilutions. I should mention the volume we use for this, for our procedure is 200 microliters of the imidazole buffered BSA. And we'll see here at the end that we also add the aminazole buffered BSA to the one and two mixture for the positive control. Now the negative and positive controls, um, the negative control is tested neat only and the positive control to quantify the inhibitor in that sample needs to be tested at uh, neat and one and two. Then we'll go ahead and we'll add the patient sample to the mix. And this is where we create our serial doubling dilution. So we add 200 microliters of patient sample to the neat vial. And then we do the same to the one and two. And to create these serial dilutions, once we add 200 microliters to the mix, we take that mixture, we draw 200 microliters back off the vial, transfer it to the next vial and begin that process again, thereby diluting out the inhibitor or the sample with suspected inhibitor as we go down through the dilutions. And then we do the same for the negative control, 200 microliters into the neat vial. And for the positive control, we do, we add 200 microliters to the neat vial, and then we will add 200 microliters to the one and two dilution as well. And I should also mention that when you reach your final dilution, whatever that is that you go out to, you need to take 200 microliters back off that sample and discard it. You will always have 200 microliters of sample remaining um, wherever you decide to end your dilutions. 
So now what we have here is a panel, I'll call it, of heat inactivated uh, test tubes. So there's, there, there's no factor eight present in this, in this panel because we've done the pre-analytical heat treatment step. And now we need to add back a source of factor eight in equal amounts for those inhibitors to act upon during the two hour incubation. So I'll show that here as equal amounts of the aminazole buffered pool normal plasma. And again, that's 200 microliters added to each of the samples to give a final test volume of 400 microliters in this assay. We add it to all of the patient test mixes. And this is what the suspected inhibitors in these, in these tubes will act upon once we do the two hour incubation. So same thing for the negative control and the positive control, we add back 200 microliters of the IBPMP. And you can see here, we've already established that in our control mix. So once that's done, we, have, we now have all of our test mixes ready to be incubated. So it's important to make sure that everything is mixed. And at this stage, we will put all of these samples into a 37 degree water bath for two hours. And this is the portion of the assay where we're really establishing that Bethesda unit, the inhibitors are acting upon the factor eight that we, that we added back in. And that's how we will determine our residual activity and ultimately the BU. So we take our test samples off of the water bath after the two hour incubation, and we immediately measure the factor eight activity on an automated coagulation analyzer. Um, the residual activity, factor eight activity for the test mixes and the positive and negative controls are calculated relative to the control mix. And then we use that value to convert to Bethesda units. And I'll show you how that is calculated here. So we have uh, to establish our residual activity. We have the test mix percent factor eight activity. That's the value from the analyzer over the control mix factor eight activity to give us a percent residual activity. We put that number into this uh, logarithmic formula here, and we take the result of this calculation and multiply it by the dilution factor. So whichever vial is selected uh, for your residual activity, which should be the vial closest to 50%, it is then multiplied, uh, that, that number, if it's the third vial, is used as the final multiplication in this formula. So for a rough example, <clears throat> if we see a 100% residual activity, well, we know that there's no inhibitor in that sample acting upon the factor eight that we've added back in. So there's zero BU in that sample. On the other hand, if we see a 50% residual activity, we know that that sample has one BU as we know that one BU is defined as the amount of inhibitor required to deactivate factor eight activity by 50% after a two hour incubation. <clears throat> 